Hello everyone and welcome to Speaker Series, our monthly webinar about bigger picture issues and what they might mean to financial advisors, business owners and professionals in the health and wellbeing space. Today we've got a fantastic session lined up featuring none other than workplace wellbeing thought leader Professor Sir Carrie Cooper and Vitality at Work Director Jill Pritchard. But before I kick off today's discussion from my home studio as we await to move offices in uh, Vitality, I'd like to tell you a bit about what's planned for the next speaker series. Our final session in our winter programme taking place on the 23rd of March. We're really excited to be joined by Vitality Ambassador Ellie Simmons to hear about her time af um, after appearing on Strictly Come Dancing and how she stayed active following her time as a gold medal winning Paralympian. We'll also touch upon how the workplace can be more inclusive and supportive to those living with disabilities. It should, should be an excellent session, so please do remember to sign up. On to today's session. It's clear for all of us to see that UK employees today are facing a perfect storm. It's likely that every pillar of our well-being at work is in some way being impacted. Financial health is under strain as we go through a cost of living crisis and face a recession. This is, of course, impacting the mental health of our nation, while the UK faces a physical health challenge in the form of obesity and a lack of physical activity. And socially, we're still adjusting to hybrid working modes following the pandemic and striving to get the balance right when it comes to reaching levels of productivity that make us you know, uh, well, feel well at work, effectively. So recent uh, Vitality uh, Britain's Healthiest Workplace data tells us that one in five employees are suffering from burnout. Businesses are losing as much as 80 million hours a year from employee sick leave due to burnout. And according to the ONS, around 2.5 million people report long-term sickness as the main reason for their economic inactivity. And that was between June um, and, 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 and August 2022, which is half a million more than in 2019. And that is reflected in what we're seeing within Britain's healthiest workplace, which shows us that productivity losses are up 39% since the previous survey in 2019. And that's leading to an overall economic cost of 170, sorry, 127.9 billion in, in 2022. Um, so yeah, to dig into this data and talk a bit more about the dynamics affecting UK employees at the moment, I'm pleased to welcome Professor of Organisational Psychology and Health at the Alliance Manchester Business School, Sir Carrie Cooper. Thanks for joining us. Great to be here. And we've got Jill Pritchard, Vitality at Work Director, also with us too. Hi, Jill. Hello. Great to have you both with us. It's going to be a, a really interesting discussion. As I've just sort of said there, there's, there's quite a lot at the moment, a lot of challenges face, facing employees. Employers have a changing role here uh, to, 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 to meet the needs of employees and support them in the right way. But, but, but times have, are changing, aren't they, Carrie? There's, there's, a, there's a lot happening uh, out there at the moment. I mean, I'll start with this question then. So how healthy, in your opinion, do you think the UK workforce is? At the moment, I don't think very healthy. Listen, my books on stress are selling like hotcakes. So there must be problems out there. No, seriously, if you think about it, I think the pandemic started it in a way. No, it actually started before the pandemic. It started during the financial crisis of 2008 to 2015. That's where work began to change. People started to look at well-being, how do we retain staff and so on. Now, as you said, Adam, absolute perfect storm. We have cost of living crisis. So we have people worried about their financial well-being. Absolutely a big, big issue. We have a recession we're already in and we'll get worse for the next year, maybe 18 months. We don't even know how long it's going to be. And it probably just won't be in the UK. It'll be more or less global. What does that mean? That means people are feeling job insecure about that. Well, because let's listen in, in 2008 to 2012, people lost their job in big numbers. So you tend to get in recessions, job loss. So people are kind of worried about that. Will I have a job? What's going to happen? Then there is kind of political instability as well, uh, partly, and we've just seen it this week, uh, the worries about will we get food in? That's all about partly about Brexit. I don't think it's just the weather. It is also about transport and, and the complications in, in the Brexit scenario. 
So we have a lot of things hitting people all at the same time. And the other thing that I think underpins a lot of this is during the pandemic, I think we all reflected on, you know, what is work all about? Do I really enjoy it? Um, what's my life about? What do I want out of life? Because we had two years lockdown to reflect on it. And, I, and that's why we've had the great resignation. And that's why the millennials are also now saying, well, I want a good quality of working life. If I don't get it, I'm gone. These are young millennials and Zeds, Zed gens, and they're leaving. They're, they're not like their parents. They're not gonna tolerate a work environment that doesn't value and trust them and give them some autonomy and you know, motivate them and, and have a pleasant quality of working life. So I think all of that mishmash, I think, is affecting people's well-being and listening to the news. I now no longer listen to the news. At six o'clock, I'll go five minutes to make sure that we're not being attacked by Russia. And then I, uh, I shut it off. I just hear the basics. And, and that's because we're getting a drip feed of, ver of negativity all the time. And that's, not a, that's badly affecting people's, I think, mental well-being. So it's a difficult time and employers have a really important role. We spend more of our waking hours at work than we do home with our families. So let's see what we can do. How can we recreate? How can we recreate a, a good quality of working life for all the people in the workplace? Get our productivity up, get our stress-related sickness absence down. That's a really, uh, really insightful summary, uh, Carrie. And, and Jill, um, I, I gave a bit of a, I sort of set the scene there with some of the data we're seeing within Britain's healthiest workplace, but basically gave some of the headlines. Um, but, but what is the data telling us uh, when it comes to how healthy we are in the workplace? Um, what, what employers are facing right now? Because there's, there's a real wealth of data in Britain's healthiest workplace, and I only really just gave the, the kind of the high-level stats there. I. I completely agree with Carrie. It's undeniable that the health of the UK workforce is deteriorating and the risk factors are much higher. But this isn't a pandemic. This isn't a new thing. If we go right back, we, we started Britain's Healthiest Workplace 10 years ago and the trend was increasingly getting worse back from 2014. So if you, if you take mental health, which is obviously a real high priority at the moment, back in 2014, the percentage of those people that were reporting that they had high risk of depression was 3.4%. Was and then it progressively got worse to 2019 when it was as high as 8.4%. I think what the pandemic done is it accelerated that. So now when we look at the amount of people that are displaying those high risk factors of depression, anxiety, it's 10.4%. So you can see that it was gradually getting worse, but the pandemic has then accelerated that, those increased risk factors. And that's just looking at mental health, but you see that across the board. So let's take obesity, it's a similar trend. 2014, 15% were saying they were obese, 2019, 20%, but 2022, 25%. So it's this pandemic where people have been, had that isolation, the challenges of, of working from home, the uncertainty, but also potentially living a more sedentary lifestyle has, 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 has increased those risk factors. And I think with Carrie says, you know, we spend a lot of time with work and that gives the opportunity for employers to support us. And it's, the area that concerns me is when we dig in the data, it's the lower socioeconomic demographic groups that are suffering the most. So when you look at, and, and then you have younger age that naturally fits into that, that cohort, but yeah, the, the risk factors of those are, are much higher. Um, Adam, as you know, in vitality, we utilize the clinical algorithm that gives you your vitality age. So it's your health age as opposed to your chronological age. And we utilize the vitality age calculator in the BHW as that measure of health, both physical health metrics and also lifestyle. And when we looked at that vitality age gap, which is our measure of health, so those people that had five years or more um, um, gap, when you look at the people that are earning less than 40,000, it was just under 30% that had a vitality age gap of five years or more. But as people earn more and more money, it was literally a straight line graph going up and the percentage dropped when you get to that exact level, there was only 15%. So for me, there's something about making sure when we look at wellbeing, we're looking at everybody and really focusing on those people who are probably struggling most as a result of the pandemic and the cost of living crisis is going to be adding even more further burden on that cohort. 
It's really alarming, isn't it, given the, the current yeah. backdrop with the cost of living crisis, because it's socioeconomic... It's starting point. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. They're, but they're only going to get worse, right? There's this yeah. financial health uh, pillar I mentioned of our well-being at the beginning, it's, that's the one at the moment that's kind of in the spotlight alongside everything else, and everything's connected, right? It, it's all um, it's all um, impacting on one on the other. Um, but uh, there's a couple of things there uh, as well, Carrie. I, I guess, in a way, I, I'm not surprised that the... Um, that the that through this period of adjustment post the pandemic, uh, COVID and beyond, that that along the way there's a gap, there's been a gap in in kind of well-being support, or at least a transition where employers are getting used to it. But prior to the pandemic, I was under the impression and felt that uh, employers were becoming more strategic about health and well-being. And then the pandemic almost triggered kind of employers to do more and and, and step in and find new ways and innovate and, and find remote solutions and, and and talk about it more. There's been a big mental health awareness situation we've seen it for longer than five years now. But then to see the stats that Jill just presented that depression is 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 effectively uh, worsening levels of depression. Um, burnout is on the rise. Why do you think that is, Carrie? What, why, why, why aren't we getting better at looking after our people? Okay, I, I think I think Jill highlighted the issues. And listen, I think you're right. During the pandemic, organizations had to get had to get real. I mean, we were working remotely. They had to find ways of solving these kinds of problems and so on. When they got into the well-being arena, I think it was low-hanging fruit to start with. So it was things like. Uh, mindfulness at lunch and you know the, the well-being day with smoothies and massages uh and bean bags and ping pong tables you, no that's not well-being that's fun i love it i love going to well-being day and getting my, my smoothie and being massaged on my head you know an indian massage however that is not well-being and i think what's happened is the reason we haven't seen a major shift in in jill's stats is because only now are organizations realizing well-being is a strategic issue. And what do I mean by that? I mean, we need, and many companies are getting it now, we have directors of health and well-being in many organizations throughout the UK, public and private sector. They usually report to the HR director or the chief medical officer if it's a big company, or in some cases, the CEO. So that's a good start. This is an important function, it's strategic, now this next stage they're moving to and this is the positivity so i head i chair the national forum for health and well-being at work which i created five and a half years ago because some chief medical officers came to me at manchester business school and said carrie we need a place to do things in this space i said you guys are and gals are too busy what do you mean what do you mean do things we want to do things in the health and well-being we want to really make a difference and not just have a, a smoothie day i said that's that's fine so we formed five and a half years ago, um, a national forum, we meet regularly and we actually do things. It's made up HR directors, chief medical officers, directors of health and well-being of major, major companies, global, UK government, uh, civil services in it, the NHS executive and so on. Okay, now what they say is we now have to have the metrics to measure what good looks like in an organization. Uh, and, and I think we'll talk a bit about that maybe a little bit later. So we need the metrics so that the board is held accountable for those metrics. Things like employee satisfaction rates, um, labor turnover. Um, you know, are people leaving your organization? Where are they leaving from and why are they leaving? We need good metrics and then we need somebody, and this is again strategic. What do we do when we had the problem with the gender pay gap? when it was mandated that organizations have to report the gender pay gap, gap annually, what happened? It narrowed. So the same thing will apply, I think, with well-being. Once organizations are, are encouraged or mandated to report levels of turnover, stress-related ill health, job satisfaction levels, in their annual report, I guess what will happen, believe me, there'll be much more that become makes it much more strategic because the board then goes down to the operational people and says, guess what, HR director, we expect you to deliver on this, Oc the, the, the director of occupational health, we expect you to deliver on this, 
you know, because we're not looking good. We're losing a lot of people. 32% of our, our young recruits are going. We went last year. What are you, what are you going to do? So that's what makes things in a way strategic. So we need the infrastructure. And we're getting that, by the way. So there are 44 companies in my national forum. And we're all talking about, we had a special meeting at BT where we actually looked at the metrics. We looked at uh, how we need somebody, a, non, a NED, a non-executive director at board level, who's responsible for employee health and well-being. Listen, we've been hearing HR say for years, the most valuable resource we have is our human resource. Well, let's action that. The only way we're gonna be able to action that is see what we're actually doing to employees and doing something about it and changing it. And, and that measurement process is twofold, isn't it? It's, it's so you can have a look at what, see, so you can see what you're looking at, but also so you can justify investment from a kind of return of, of investment point of view too. And it can actually, at board level, one of the things we recommended at Vitality following our healthy hybrid research was that, um, that well-being should be factored in as part of a business's risk register. And it's just kind of what you're saying, isn't it, Carrie? Yeah. So, so absolutely. Uh, but by the way, I think there are organisations like the CIPD, the Professional Body for HR, which does have it as a kind of risk factor. There are a lot of organisations now that look at, for example, turnover, labour turnover. Are we losing people? That's a risk. Well-being. I mean, are people happy here? There are organisations now doing that. That's really important. Now, I think when we get it in the annual report as well. That'll be, not in the sustainability report. Nobody reads that. I shouldn't say that, but I don't think many people do. And I, I think it's important we get it in the annual report. Why shouldn't those metrics, some of the metrics be there, both subjective metrics and objective metrics? Because that tells you a lot about an organization and how much they actually value uh, the employee. It's an interesting point about sustainability, actually, maybe one we'll return to around how ESG has been obviously in the fo a focus of many organisations. And, and it's not a stretch to imagine that sort of the social in ESG might be associated with well-being. But uh, it it's is. interesting yeah. most of what you're saying there, maybe, Carrie, forgive me if I'm wrong, but it's almost that it needs to be outside of the ESG strategy. It needs to be something in its own right. Um, but before if we do kind of go into that one, Jill, I'm really keen to hear from you, from you on this around kind of what are we seeing in, in employers doing well? What are we seeing them not doing enough of? Uh, what, what can we learn from, from the data and also your, your opinions on the matter? I think what's positive is I think more organisations are putting wellbeing on the agenda. I think I carry the 41 organisations are working with as part of the forum. I would imagine they've been quite experienced and have established that actually there are many organisations that previously may have not even had wellbeing as part of their strategy at all. Um, and certainly in, in, in my in job, I'm, I'm seeing that organisations are now, you know, their, their staff may have had challenging times during the pandemic, maybe because they didn't have the opportunity to work at home because they were actually needing to be in a shop or in a social setting or in the NHS. And, and, and so therefore they've appreciated that their staff now need support. Or it might be organisations that have done actually quite well out of the pandemic and they've now got this talent war in order to be able to keep their their employees because other organizations have done well in a similar way. So I, I'm certainly seeing a lot more organizations coming now and wanting support for well-being. My, my nervousness is that we just go on a shopping spree and just buy a dispersed set of initiatives that is not necessarily actually going to make a difference. And they're just sticky plasters that look good rather than necessarily it becomes your culture. And the BHW data suggests that. I'm not necessarily saying it's the case, but when we look back in 2019, 50% of employees said that they had less than 20 interventions available for them for health and well-being. When we asked the question again in 2022, over 80% of respondents said they had 40 or more interventions. And that just seems to me like such a big shift. Um, and I just question are they the right interventions and have they been put in there for the right reasons or did it just look nice and so they're going back to let's look at the data to understand before we put an initiative in place let's look at the risk factors of actually what is the challenges for our organization and then think about how we put those together and there's another bit of research that we've done previously where we looked at the impact of engagement in well-being when it was a comprehensive well-being strategy compared to a set of disparate interventions, and the comprehensive strategy was 2.4 times more effective. So what I 
it's lovely and it's brilliant that the priority has gone up. But I think organisation may need to just say pause. What have we put in place? Why have we put in place? And can we measure the effectiveness? Because guess what? Your FD is going to be coming and saying, is it worth the money that we've been spending? So you're going to have to be proactive and make sure that you're comfortable and you can justify the spend that you've done and you actually know that it's helping and addressing the risk factors that are specifically within your organisation. So it's clear that sort of the organisations are waking up or they've woken up to wellbeing, yeah. but it's, yeah. it's the what and it's the how the, the, yeah. that's most important. So what are the most efficient ways to do it, Jill? Yeah, I mean, just to say as well, when we looked at the interventions, we also asked employees, how do you feel supported by your employer? And when we asked about being unwell, 61% um, of people said that they felt supported by their employer when they were well, so, unwell. So it feels like you know, when you get to a crisis point or when you're getting to burnout or when you've got you know, get MSK issues, we're doing quite well at that point. But it was less so with the preventative health care. So only 33% felt supported to be physically active, 25% to eat a healthy diet. And so that's where I'm thinking, mm, you know, it'd be much nicer if we worked in a preventative manner, because actually that's where we're going to, I'd much prefer to help people before they get to the point of burnout. Um, but when we looked at organisations, taking over Nordis as an organisation who's done something well, they have pulled their strategy together. It's all comprehensive. They've made it really easy to communicate. And it's a very much a, a family feel. So the employees are part of building that strategy. And you look to the similar statistics for them. 65% felt supported to be physically active. 60% felt supported to eat healthily. So it is possible to do, but it just can't be sticky plasters. It has to be culture that sits around that. Yes, and and, and it's a really interesting example. That case study of Nova Nordis is an interesting one. I guess it's often in 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 the kind of the selection of uh, benefits on offer, but also how they communicate it as well, and, yeah, and exactly. the strategy in place to do that. So, so Carrie, connected to that, what's the role of the of the line manager in all of this? I mean, you mentioned kind of the example of a, of a line manager um causing a problem but there, there's also a, a, an opportunity there for them to be part of the solution as well so um two quite two parts of the question really when it comes to the communication of these benefits what's a, what's what does good look like and secondly and what does the what role does the line manager play in all of this yeah i think the line manager is very critical when i formed the national forum five and a half six years ago um on the first meeting we were saying well who are we going to bring what are the issues what are the big issue big picture issues your HR directors, your chief medical officers, directors of health and well-being, you're responsible for it in all these global companies. What do you think is really the, if you were to do one thing, what would you do? And they said, they all said, I think our problem is the line manager from shop floor to top floor. And why they said that was, think about how you get promoted or recruited for a job. It's based on your technical skills, not your people skills. And that's a problem we have. So we have quite a lot of managers out there, technically are very, very competent technically, but don't, either haven't had the appropriate training in terms of people skills, or don't have them naturally, or by the way, should never be in a managerial role. Stay in a technical role, but stay away from human beings, because there are people like that. And I estimate that about 40% of people that we promote to managerial roles or recruit them have these people skills EQ, emotional intelligence, naturally. They're just good at dealing with people, are very socially sensitive, empathetic, compassionate, listen, and all that. Probably 40% don't have those skills, but are trainable. And my real worry is the 20% or so who shouldn't really be near people because they're untrainable. They just don't, their pre personality predisposition is, is not good in terms of managing human beings. So in the future, what we need to do, and this is what my national forum has said, is number one, we have to ensure when we recruit or promote people into managerial roles, there's parity between their people skills, emotional intelligence, et cetera, and their technical skills. They have to have the technical skills, no question, but you need parity between. And that is a big problem, I think, that's affected UK productivity badly, and that we don't have enough of the right kind of people manager roles and now with the pandemic what's happened we have hybrid working boy do you need those skills more than ever before some people are going to be in the office some people are not going to be in the office how do you team build in a hybrid world people with good social skills will be able to do that people without them won't 
So, uh, and also, how do you recognize when people aren't coping? Because remember, they're not going to be in the office all the time. When they're in the office, you can see, you know, Jill, you know, Jill's behavior over the last few months, you know, she's changed. Something's, something's wrong with Jill. I can see it because she comes in, she's a little bit more withdrawn in, in meetings, um, you know, a little bit more angry, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You can see it. But when people are working quite substantially from home, many of them are working two or three days a week from home. You really do need a socially sensitive person in a manager role to identify a mental health problem. As we said earlier, 50, roughly 57% of all long-term sickness absence, as judged by the HSE, it depends which year you're looking at. Long-term sickness absence is stress, anxiety, and depression, the common mental disorders. They are massive. It used to be musculoskeletal. That's not the big issue anymore. So we have a problem. And I think the line manager is a part of the strategy, right? It's not, and then going back to something Jill said, which I think is, is really important about all these interventions, which ones work and which ones don't. I mean, a lot of them are low hanging fruit. Let's do mindfulness at lunch sessions. Uh, let's have mental health first aid. Does it work for you? Is it working? Is mindfulness at lunch working? What, uh, the, the training you're doing, is it working? Or are you just doing it to flash that you're interested in well-being and that you're a caring company? So I think we do need the uh, evaluation of the individual things that we do for people, like mindfulness or mental health first aid and so on. But we also need the strategic issues like the line manager, which for me and, and for the people uh, uh, who in, in my national forum, we, we thought that was the kind of number one issue. Another issues are technology issues like email. We don't, the right to disconnect is becoming a law throughout most of Europe now. Well, two major countries have adopted it. First, France, it's a, it's a law now. No manager can send an email out of office hours to their subordinates. Portugal has it, New Zealand has it, and many European countries, EU countries are considering. I don't particularly like the right to disconnect law because if people are going to work flexibly, you close a server down at 5.30 or you said you can't send an email then, well, maybe you're, you're going to be with your kids from 3.30 to 5.30 uh, to, until after dinner and then you're going to work at night. And if you're, if you're told you can't send emails to people, then we have problems. But it's an issue we have to look at, that people's private life is being interfered with by technology. Technology is great, nothing wrong with it, but we haven't the right guidance and we're not controlling uh, the use of it by, by the way, managers who themselves send emails to people at night, at weekends, while they're on holiday. And that shouldn't, you know, that the right to disconnect law says that's illegal. It's, it's all about balance, isn't it, isn't it Carrie? It and is actually, technology balance. can help. I've heard, I've heard people who schedule their emails to go at 8.30 in the morning, but they will send them at night, which I think is a really smart way of doing that. It means that people receive it at a later time. Um, I, I think... Before we sort of, I think there's an integrated approach, I think that Jill touched upon, and you've both kind of mentioned actually is as well carry around. It's about an embedded integrated solution that, that I'm hearing that, that to offer variety that can be tailored to people in a way that actually adds value and, and that they want to engage with. That seems to me like the, the, a solution that could potentially work. Um, would you agree with that, Jill? I do. I, I think the role of the line manager is tough, right? Because you have to do your technical job and then all of a sudden, like Carrie says, you've been promoted because you're technically good and then all of a sudden you've got to look after this team that you've never been trained to do and it might not be something natural to you. As Carrie said, some people can be trained and to be supported, but it can be quite overwhelming. And then I think for starters, if you're going to ask, you know, line managers to have a big role in well-being, which I absolutely agree with, they are fundamental. We've got to make it easy for them and we've got to support them in that. So coming back to having this comprehensive well-being strategy, let's not have 40 interventions. Let's have one, you know, one programme that's got a clear brand identity within an organisation. So. You know, if you can't put your well-being support on one page for the line manager to communicate it, they're not going to bother because it's going to be too complex because they've got lots to do. So let's make it really easy for those line managers to support their people. And then the other side of it is the stuff that comes naturally, you know, about the fact that, you know, Carrie, I've come to work and you can see I'm withdrawn. You know, you've got that natural ability to do that. And I think, 
you know, we do need to look at who we're recruiting for our line managers and have they got that empathy and, and actually had used to support them. So I think there's a, a big, big element of that. But it starts with the line manager themselves because right, they're employees in their own right. And what the data showed us from, from BHW this year is when we actually look at burnout, which is a concern, it was our manager population that had the highest proportion of burnout. And why that is, it's probably because they've actually suddenly got a group of employees that they've got to look after as well as do their technical skills, as well as communicate all the support that's there for them. So they've become overwhelmed and it's quite a significant difference. So our manager population, the percentage reporting burnout was 24%, whereas our non-manager population was 18.7. And that feels like too much of a gap for me. And there's, there's a lovely um, piece of research from, from Nicholas Baer that, that showed there was a direct correlation that healthier managers had healthier people working for them. Now, I'm not sure which way that is, but I, I'm sure there's a role model thing to play there. You know, I put a lot of effort into my health. All of my team can see at lunchtime, there is an hour blocked out to go for a run. You know, I'm, I'm showing that that's important for me and it's important for me to see in my team when it actually gives everybody else that permission to do it. So healthier managers have healthier people. So I think we have a role to focus on our managers and actually support them and actually say, do you know what? If you don't want to be a line manager, just be really technically good and step down. That's OK. We don't think any less of you, but actually there is an important role to be playing in our people because otherwise it's going to affect your business with the burnout with others. Yeah, actually, I think that's a really important point, Jill. Uh, that, you know, maybe the people who do burn out in managerial roles are the people who just don't have those skills, either haven't got the proper training in it pri primarily, or really they're not good at it from a psychological point of view, a personality point of view. I think the old euphemism as well that says uh, people don't leave an organization, they leave a boss, boss. Yeah. is really quite significant. Almost every, anybody I know over the last few years who's left a particular job has left it because of their boss. Because their boss has not had the skills to, yeah. to make them feel valued and wanted and, you know, and you say, oh, that's soft fuzzy stuff, you know, they have to get on with their job. You could take, you know, Jacob rees mogg view of life, but um, but really to be perfectly honest with you, um, you if you have good skills, uh, good social skills you'll retain people you'll get their commitment in fact you might even get their commitment too much that they want to deliver for you and that th therefore you have to have good empathy and good social skills to know emotional skills to know hey fred you've been working 55 hours this week forget it you know that's what a good manager does mm -hmm. you've been great but that's not going to help your health i, I think jill's um example of the um the healthy manager equals healthy uh, staff, I think is, a, is an interesting point about culture, isn't it? Workplace culture. And I guess, and this has already been touched upon, it's, it starts from the top, and then that obviously drips down into the line manager. You create a supportive environment for them, it creates a supportive environment for their, their staff members, and, and there's a kind of a drip down effect. But I guess a lot of the people watching this will be um, consultants, employee benefits consultants, those that, that, that deal directly with organizations. And obviously they're not, responsible for line managers directly what would you suggest to them you know how can they encourage more positive cultures at work uh, in a way that does foster higher kind of more productive uh, workforces alongside um, greater well-being well I mean do you want me to reply Adam yeah, yeah I, okay well I, I mean I... I think really it's again, going back to what Jill and I have both been saying, I think you need to do it strategically. By the way, I'm not saying that mental health first aid isn't a part of the package. That's a part of a strategy. That's, that's you know, there are two aspects to any kind of strategy. One is, particularly in the space when you're talking about employees, one is what do you do to help the individual? And then the second bit is what culture change do you need to do to create the right kind of culture in the organization, right? And those two make up the strategy. So mental health first aid might help people. There is some evidence that it's, it's successful, but you have to have the right training. The right people have to be selected to do it. This is a big issue. And the National Forum in April is holding, by the way, an open meeting at uh, Clifford Chance, because they're a part of the National Forum. We're holding an open meeting on mental health first aid. 
we're looking at all the evidence on mental health first aid, what it should look like, what what the thing is. So anybody wants to go, they can go go on the National Forum for Health and Wellbeing at Work website, and you can turn up to Clifford Chance and uh, apply to go. But anyway, those individual things need to be uh, part of it. But then you have to have the cultural things, and that goes back to the line manager. That goes back to saying what does good look like, you know. Vitality looks at a range of different indicators. And I think what we need are subjective and objective indicators that would that organizations ought to, you know, criteria about what makes a, a well-being culture. And if you have a lot of labor turnover, that's not good. If you have uh, high levels of stress-related sickness absence, which many organizations are not collecting data on or presenteeism, which you're collecting data on as well, incidentally. These are, you know, objective measures. Um, then there are subjective measures like, are the people happy here? You know, happiness, job satisfaction measures. We have good indicators. We can, we have good metrics. We can measure these things. Are people happy in this organization? And you can do, by the way, that in real time. You don't have to do that with an annual survey, which I think is useless, just an annual survey. I think you need to be collecting data in real time on employee health and well-being. Uh, and I remember there was a, a company I went to once which did a really interesting thing. What they did is in the lift, everybody had to take the lift up to the top floors of this organization. And they had just a simple thing, which is how are you feeling today as you enter the lift in the morning? And they had a smiley face and a sad face and a neutral face and you hit it and it collected the data and coming back at night and they could do it and they could actually look at it from the point of view what floor had the worst negative look i mean i know it was primitive but the point i'm trying to make is sometimes we we, we have the technology now we have mobile phones we should be doing this in real time we should be finding out how people are feeling all the time if you're not feeling good go on your mobile phone hit that app tell us and let's see if we're getting a lot of people doing it and are they coming from certain parts of the organization then you can go dig deeper and find out what the hell's going on so there are technologies that we could use a strategy is critical here absolutely and, yeah. metrics, and metrics to measure whether you are creating a well-being culture or not and some some objective some subjective but just having those those uh, those um kind of those metrics in place. And Jill, just before I turn to you in a moment about kind of um, kind of technology and tools, just a reminder to our viewers, please do send your questions in for, for Carrie and, and Jill. We'll have some time soon to, to start asking them. I've already seen a couple come in so far. So please do, if you want to share your thoughts or ask any questions. Um, but Jill, you mentioned earlier about the preventative elements of, of supporting health and wellbeing holistically within the workplace. And I guess, and, and to, add to Carrie's point about measuring people's wellbeing, it can also play a role in um, encouraging people, nudging them, um, supporting them to make healthy lifestyle choices. Uh, and you see that a lot, don't you, in the kind of the, 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 business, the businesses that score well on Britain's healthiest workplace data? Absolutely. I think for, for the business consultants out there, the, the, you have to start understand your starting point. So if you just look at the data that you might have available, so EAP data or absence data, you know, it's not a total workforce picture. And if you're actually going to start looking at a preventative, preventative health strategy, you have to see your whole population. And you're not, and, and I know a lot of business consultants and on, on organizations are so looking, where do I start with this? And actually you are going to need to have it higher up on the priority of the board. And to start with that, you, that's where the data is going to be critical. Um, and I think that's where Britain's Healthiest Workplace has a really, big role to play um, and please contact um, Adam, I'm sure we'll be giving the contact details afterwards, but it's a completely free of charge survey and it just allows organisations, whether they're completely new to wellbeing or whether they're quite experienced, but it allows them either to see the starting point or actually see where are they as a result of the pandemic and what do they have in place and how is it affecting. So I think that's a really good place to, to, to kickstart it. Because once you've got that data, you can then take it to your board and put all of the things that Carrie said in place. Right, okay, we've got the data. We can tell you about how our organization is now. We need somebody either on the board or a non-exec director to take accountability for well-being. We need that ability and that voice to come back on a monthly basis to keep those that data coming. 
and and so therefore you've got that initial start picture and then you can start to think how do you get that data coming through all the time and i think that's very helpful the value that britain's healthiest workplace brings adam is that we measure three aspects so if we ask the employees about the culture the services that are offered are they aware of them do they participate in them do they feel benefit from them how do they feel supported by their line manager so there's a lot of questioning about that culture and the environment we then ask about the, the health of those people using that vitality age calculator i spoke about so it's all aspects of physical health lifestyle risk factors and then we ask about the business performance so productivity engagement job satisfaction are they likely to leave and by bringing those three components together, you can start to get some really good relationships that you can show that actually those people that are not supported by the line managers, guess what? They have got a higher risk of burnout. Then guess what? Those people that have got a higher risk of burnout, they're your least productive people in the organisation. Until you've got that start data to go to your FD and to your chief exec to say, unless we thought this problem out, we are actually going to be losing productivity and engagement. And guess what? Our best people are going to leave. So I, I would really encourage, it's a free survey and it does give you that starting point that you can then go and build the strategy. And from a business consultant perspective, you've got the data to understand that the risk factors and where they're sitting. You know, your staff are physically inactive, your staff are, you know, so you can just start to build it based upon pure data, true data on that organisation rather than a guesswork. That's a really um, insightful kind of um, uh, illustration of, of how it works. I had a great I connected actually before we sort of um, jump further into the discussion. I've got a great question from Jessica Baker come through, um, and this is to, to both of you. Um, how would you suggest positioning these strategies to a higher management team for their buy-in? And I think you, it very much relates to what you were just talking about. Um, I guess though that what they're asking here, what Jessica's asking here, is 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 around sort of kind of like how do we how do you sell them into the concept of, of well-being even before they may not even realize that they need to do something that's a that's a really good question i mean if they're starting from ground zero we have a problem i mean if they're starting from ground zero the first thing i think they probably ought to do is they're not going to make it strategic they're not going to go immediately to the board and have a non-executive director on the board they're not going to that, that's a step probably a step too far i'd start with a director of health and well-being and the HR director should either reporting to the HR director to occupational health or to health and safety in some organization. By the way, in some organizations, it's a CEO, a director of health and well-being who's responsible for starting to look at this as a, a more strategic issue. I think that's stage one. And then getting employee voice is number two. So that person should then ask they should be doing well-being audits. And there are lots of organizations out there who do well-being audits and they're great and collecting the data on employee voice how do the how does the employees perceive the hours they work the way they're managed and so on all aspects of their work environment the amount of emails they get and so on you, there are uh, uh, proper psychometric tools that people can use to do that and get employee voice so that person then has the a picture of the organization breaking it down by by gender by age by uh, where you work what part of the organization your department etc and then you can start thinking of a strategy now what am i going to do in that part of the business there's a long hours culture over there there's a bully a bullying culture over there there is a glass ceiling for women we have that requires a, a strategic a different strategic approach for each of those but now you have employee voice. You know how they're perceiving, how they're managed, the hours they work, and, and so on, or, or not being able to work flexibly, for example, as you get in some investment banks. Okay, so that that's the that for me is a starter. Director of health and well-being work, employee voice next, start building your strategy. Later you can start talking about a non-executive director on the board. But even that director of health and well-being should be able to put together a proper metrics to measure whether that organization, uh, whether the senior leadership team in that organization should be held accountable for problems that are occurring and therefore should do something about them. Yeah, I guess a really interesting point. And, and I think as well, that employees today expect it, don't they? I think the pandemic helped, but there's an element of, we live in a society today where 
I think, especially the a generation of, 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 not to make too much of a, of a massive generalization, but Generation Z, millennials, they expect um, their employer to, to care about um, di diversity and inclusion. They expect them to care about um, trans issues. They expect them to be aware of uh, gender dysphoria. All of these issues now, neurodiversity, are all things that are, are in the public eye. So an employer cannot afford to not consider their well-being strategy because it encompasses all of these different you know, things. You know, you know, Adam, when I first started uh, doing some work in this field during the pandemic, no, I meant prior to the pandemic, during the financial crisis, I said to one HR director uh, in, in, in the finance sector, just at a meeting, and, and, he, and I said, why are you doing something in this space? And, and he said two words. He said, regrettable turnover. And I said, what do you mean by that? It's a lovely concept. I ha think I have to write a book, a another book on it. What he meant by that is we, we have become so mean and lean during the financial crisis. Remember, they lost 30, 40% of their employees. Um, not that organization, but the sector did. And um, they couldn't afford to lose any more. Regrettable turnover. People we cannot afford to lose, right? And so talent retention was a big driver. By the way, it still is a big driver. It should be even bigger driver now because we lost people as a consequence of Brexit. Uh, we've lost, we, 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 our skill base is low. We don't have enough skilled people to do the jobs uh, in a whole range of sectors. So we need to retain good staff and attract good staff. So I think that's a really good bottom line reason why organizations should be in this space anyway. And again, you're right, Adam. The millennial, the young millennials and the Z generation won't tolerate what their parents tolerated. Number one, they don't have mortgages. They don't have to tolerate a, a crap job. That's a technical expression, by the way. They don't have to tolerate that because you know what? They have skills themselves and they can go elsewhere. And they don't and they want good quality of work in life, and you won't keep them or attract them if you say they can't work flexibly, if you don't make them feel valued and trusted. And I'll, it's not that they're being entitled. It's just that they want a good quality of life. They have other problems in their life, financial. They can't afford to buy a house, a flat, or anything, that generation. At least what they want is good work. I agree. It's, it's almost um, employers need to need to move with the times. They wouldn't ignore technology and, and get left behind. So why would they ignore their, their people and what they what they want um, from, from their workplace? Um, Jilla, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think just going back to the question of actually how do you how do you get that starting point and get it on the agenda? I think my view is actually speak the language that's important to your organization. So what are your board talking about at the moment? Is it about turnover too high? Is it financial problems? Is it the engagement is too too low? Because what, what we've been able to do is look at the data to say, so if it's financial that's problem, okay, let's let's prove that your people that have got burnout, their productivity loss is twice as worse as those somebody that's not. You know, turn it into that language. I mean, it's then taking a turnover. Actually, let's ask to find out how, what percentage of your people are considering leaving in the next 12 months. Let's correlate that to find out who those individuals are. Because if you could take it that to say, what's causing that? What's the why behind it? And take it back. Then you can actually put that business case forward within the language that your business is talking about. And you're much more likely to be able to get that resource or prioritization. I mean, the burnout one really, when we look at the productivity loss of people that are suffering from burnout or fatigue, it's more than twice the percentage of time than somebody that's not. I mean, that in itself is a business case to really help and make sure that you don't get to that point where your people are suffering to the point of burnout. Yeah, and it's about making sure that it's a need to have and considered a need to have, not a nice to have. Bear in mind. The fact that we're facing a recession and um Correct. okay admittedly there's you there's still a not to. you can't afford not to but yeah. admittedly that you know there is a an issue with retention at the moment but you know as, as carrie said at the top of the uh, the webinar that that we may see unemployment um and and actually the the what's well, likely that we will if, if the economy continues in the route that it's going down so it's about keeping 
uh, employee well-being on the agenda. And I think, Jill, what you just explained is, is a really good way to do that. Um, we're running out of time, about sort of, you know, a few, few minutes left or so. Um, please, if you've got any final questions for, for Jill and Carrie, please, please ask them. Uh, um, Francesca Tinson has asked, um, will it be possible to, to get a copy of the transcript? Well, we can go one better. We can send you a, a link to the, uh, the webinar on YouTube. Uh, it will be available on the Vitality Advisor YouTube afterwards. So you can watch again or share with your colleagues and, and, and watch uh, at your leisure. Um, and just one, one question for me, really, just to kind of kick things off, like what, what's next? I mean, we've, we've touched upon a lot of this today, but um, we, we're obviously adjusting to still to hybrid working. Um, we could agree that workplace well-being is very much on the agenda. It can't be ignored, it, it, but it needs to be continued to be reinforced. But, but Carrie, how is it evolving um, without, I guess, um, being uh, looking at the, um, the challenges we face? How can we be positive? Um, what's I mean, I'm, we're all we're optimists. I, I'd like to think. You know, well, what's next? Yeah, actually, I think it is in a way quite positive because think about it. Just over the last week, we had the four-day working week, didn't we? In those 61 organizations. Incidentally, work had already been done in Sweden, Iceland, New Zealand, and a range of other countries where they looked at the four-day working week, coming coming up with roughly the same almost the same kind of results so i think you know what you know what the pandemic's done it's made us rethink the whole of work you know so we're working hybridly now that's normal now it's been normalized now we're thinking about man do we need to work five day weeks who does how do we do this you know and and what is for me positive is we're going through and the great resignation in a way is a part of that I, don't, I thought reflected on my job, but I didn't actually like working for that organization. Now I want to go, so what do I want for me in my job? And I think I'll go to that organization because they seem to have the values I believe in and treat people the way I think. So I think the future, it's still open. I think we're in the middle of a change, a massive change about the nature of work itself, how it fits in with our family life, what technology we use and what and we make sure that we're not totally just using technology that we haven't uh, you know that we not we, we, we don't, don't get rid of the face-to-face -face, which meets a lot of our social needs we're thinking about all this stuff i think now um the right to disconnect is an example of it you pass a law in france that says you can't send an email out of office hours to your support it's amazing law i mean th there's a downside to it as i said earlier but the point I'm trying to make is it's under a microscope now work. The workplace is under a microscope. And if we may change it as a result of the pandemic on the hybrid thing, we're now into the four day working week. There's a whole load of things that I think are gonna start coming up. Uh, and work I think will never be the same after this pandemic. Uh, my worry by the way, in the immediate future in the recession is my worry is that a lot of people organizations will think things are okay because i anticipate that stress related that sickness absence will decline dramatically like it did in 2012 2008 and what we get is an increase in presenteeism people working really long hours to show they're committed so they're not the next tranche of people made redundant so in the short term i'm worried about the impact of the recession in the long term i think the, millenn the young millennials of Z generation will take all of us with them in a different direction and a, in, a, in a good direction and make us more productive. We can't be any less productive. We're bottom of the G7 on productivity per capita and 17th in the G20 on productivity per capita. We're not in good shape. So the UK has a great opportunity to change and change in the right direction. Get good quality of working life. That's the journey we're on, isn't it, Carrie? Um, yes. Any thoughts about what's what's next, uh, Jill, from your side? Yeah, I'm I'm with Carrie. I think this is a, a great opportunity now because well-being is a higher priority. It's being demanded by employees, but also employers are are reflecting and have we got things in place? And and those organisations that were prepared before the pandemic did much better than those that had nothing. You know, it was much harder to to make that shift. My view is we just spend so much time in work and two things is one, you don't want to wait a lot of your life not enjoying yourself. 
but more so because you spend so much time in work, the employer has such an opportunity to notice those things when something's slightly wrong and, and actually put that support in place. And the position from an NHS, if, if every organisation really took that duty of care on board and really drove this forward, the social care impact could be quite significant. And so my plea to organisations is don't let this just be a something that we're talking about at the moment and actually utilise the fact that it's higher on the agenda at the moment to get the robust mechanisms in place that it will keep it there. So have the borderline reporting, have the data and understand it from a longer term strategy so that actually we can continue this and, and therefore really make a difference in, in the next five years and, and going forward. I'm really encouraged by that, Jill, because once the genie's out the bottle, it's very hard to put yeah. it back in, right? Exactly. Once employers exactly. and, 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 and organisations have got to acknowledge the elephant, I'm using lots of metaphors here, but the elephant in the room is that they've got to look after their stuff. You can't just, you can't ignore it, right? Um, yeah. I've got a question directly, for one for you actually, Jill, around what can Vitality do to give an HR team um, help when supporting their strategy? I'd love to help. Give us our contact details. Um, so the, the focus for Vitality is is really helping with that culture and well-being strategy. So the Vitality programme in itself helps the individual from a preventative perspective and it works through the behaviour change that ultimately leave for long-term benefits. And it's the same journey, you've got to understand your starting off point. So that's with Vitality, whether we're looking at you from an organisation or whether we're supporting you as an individual, we start off of where you are now and then we put the structure and the pathways in place to help you in a personalised manner based upon the risk factors that you've shared and then we reward you for doing so. And we look at that on an organisation perspective as well. So with Britain's Healthiest Workplace, we help them understand their starting point. We'll put recommendations of the things that we should put in place that will improve that. And guess what? As an organisation, you'll be rewarded because you'll have more productive, more engaged people. Um, so, yeah, we, we love to help and we're super passionate about this. So, yeah, please do follow up afterwards. Thanks, Jill. Um, that was from Debbie Murray. Thanks for that question. Um, Bernie Erasmus has asked as well, Please do um, send over a copy of the recording. We, we will have it on YouTube, uh, as I said earlier. So definitely we'll um, share that with uh, with delegates or we'll, we'll make sure there's a way for you to get access to it. And one final question. It's probably one that we could pick up offline, Jill, perhaps, or find the right person in the business. Rodrigo Rodriguez Fernandez has asked, there was a health metric scorecard created in 2006 for C-suite level reporting. I don't have the answer to that question. Um, we, you may not either, Jill, but one maybe we could help um, Rodrigo point him in the right direction off the off the webinar. I'm sure we can find it. Apologies, I, was, I wasn't with Vitality at that point, but we will find someone who knows Rodrigo. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Yeah. Well, uh, well so my email address is adam.savile at vitality.co.uk, so feel free to drop me a line. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, as I said, I'm Adam. I've been the chief editor today. Thank you so much to Carrie and Jill for your time and insights. Some fantastic sound bites in there, some real uh, wisdom and knowledge. Um, really appreciate it. So thank you to you both. And thanks to our viewers as well for tuning in, for sticking with us today. It's been a, it's been a fantastic conversation. And then, yeah, it'll be available on demand at, to watch at your leisure. Thanks for joining us. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.